Good day to you all and welcome to this ninth day of April, day 99 in our journey through the Bible. And more importantly, this is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. The Lord is risen. He's risen indeed. And today, we're going to do what we do every day. We're going to spend some time now in God's Word. We're going to let His Word spend some time on us. You know how we need that, no doubt about that. And today, that's going to be in the book of 1 Samuel, chapters 6 and 7, then on to Psalm 72, and we'll finish in 2 Corinthians, chapter 9. This is the word of the Lord. 1 Samuel, chapter 6. The ark of the Lord remained in Philistine territory seven months in all. Then the Philistines called in their priests and diviners and asked them, What should we do about the Ark of the Lord? Tell us how to return it to its own country. Send the Ark of the God of Israel back with a gift, they were told. Send a guilt offering so that the plague will stop. Then if you are healed, you will know that it was his hand that caused the plague. What sort of guilt offering should we send, they asked. And they were told, Since the plague has struck both you and your five rulers, make five gold tumors and five gold rats just like those that have ravaged your land. Make these things to show honor to the God of Israel. Perhaps then he will stop afflicting you, your gods, and your land. Don't be stubborn and rebellious as Pharaoh and the Egyptians were. By the time God was finished with them, they were eager to let Israel go. Now build a new cart and find two cows that have just given birth to calves. Make sure the cows have never been yoked to a cart. Hitch the cows to the cart but shut their calves away from them in a pen. Put the ark of the Lord on the cart, and beside it place a chest containing the gold rats and gold tumors you are sending as a gift offering. Then let the cows go wherever they want. If they cross the border of our land and go to Bet Shemesh, we will know it was the Lord who brought this great disaster upon us. If they don't, we will know it was not his hand that caused the plague. It came simply by chance. So these instructions were carried out. Two cows were hitched to a cart, and their newborn calves were shut up in a pen. Then the ark of the Lord and the chest containing the gold rats and gold tumors were placed on the cart. And sure enough, without veering off in other directions, the cows went straight along the road toward Bet Shemesh. Lowing as they went, the Philistine rulers followed them as far as the border of Bet Shemesh. The people of Bet Shemesh were harvesting wheat in the valley. And when they saw the ark, they were overjoyed. The cart came into the field of a man named Joshua and stopped beside a large rock. So the people broke up the wood of the cart for a fire and killed the cows and sacrificed them to the Lord as a burnt offering. Several men of the tribe of Levi lifted up the ark of the Lord and the chest containing the gold rats and gold tumors from the cart and placed them on the large rock. Many sacrifices and burnt offerings were offered to the Lord that day by the people of Bet Shemesh. The five Philistine rulers watched all this and then returned to Ekron that same day. The five gold tumors sent by the Philistines as a guilt offering to the Lord were gifts from the rulers of Ashdod, Gaza, Eshkelon, Gath, and Ekron. The five gold rats represented the five Philistine towns and their surrounding villages, which were controlled by the five rulers. The large rock at Bet Shemesh, where they set the ark of the Lord, still stands in the field of Joshua as a witness to what happened there. But the Lord killed seventy men from Bet Shemesh because they looked into the ark of the Lord. And the people mourned greatly because of what the Lord had done. Who is able to stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? They cried out. Where can we send the ark from here? So they sent messengers to the people of Kiriath Jerim and told them, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come here and get it. 1 Samuel 7. So the men of kiriath Jerim came to get the Ark of the Lord. They took it to the hillside home of Abinadab and ordained Eliezer, his son, to be in charge of it. The Ark remained in kiriath Jerim for a long time, twenty years in all. During that time all Israel mourned because it seemed the Lord had abandoned them. Then Samuel said to all the people of Israel, If you want to return to the Lord with all your hearts, 
Get rid of your foreign gods and your images of Ashtoreth. Turn your hearts to the Lord and obey him alone. Then he will rescue you from the Philistines. So the Israelites got rid of their images of Baal and Ashtoreth and worshipped only the Lord. Then Samuel told them, Gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah, and in a great ceremony, drew water from a well and poured it out before the Lord. They also went without food all day and confessed that they had sinned against the Lord. It was at Mizpah that Samuel became Israel's judge. When the Philistine rulers heard that Israel had gathered at Mizpah, they mobilized their army and advanced. The Israelites were badly frightened when they learned that the Philistines were approaching. Don't stop pleading with the Lord our God to save us from the Philistines, they begged Samuel. So Samuel took a young lamb and offered it to the Lord as a whole burnt offering. He pleaded with the Lord to help Israel, and the Lord answered him. Just as Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines arrived to attack Israel. But the Lord spoke with a mighty voice of thunder from heaven that day, and the Philistines were thrown into such confusion that the Israelites defeated them. The men of Israel chased them from Mizpah to a place below beth slaughtering them all along the way. Samuel then took a large stone and placed it between the towns of Mizpah and Jeshnana. He named it Ebenezer, which means the stone of help. For he said, Up to this point the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and didn't invade Israel again for some time. And throughout Samuel's lifetime, the Lord's powerful hand was raised against the Philistines. The Israelite villages near Ekron and Gath that the Philistines had captured were restored to Israel, along with the rest of the territory that the Philistines had taken. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites in those days. Samuel continued as Israel's judge for the rest of his life. Each year he traveled around, setting up his court, first at Bethel, then at Gilgal, and then at Mizpah. He judged the people of Israel at each place. Then he would return to his home at Ramah, and he would hear cases there too. And Samuel built an altar to the Lord at Ramah. Psalm 72 A Psalm of Solomon Give your love of justice to the King, O God, and righteousness to the King's Son. Help him judge your people in the right way. Let the poor always be treated fairly. May the mountains yield prosperity for all, and may the hills be fruitful. Help him to defeat the poor, to rescue the children of the needy, and to crush their oppressors. May they fear you as long as the sun shines, as long as the moon remains in the sky, yes, forever. May the king's rule be refreshing like rain on freshly cut grass, like the showers that water the earth. May all the godly flourish during his reign. May there be abundant prosperity until the moon is no more. May he reign from sea to sea and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. Desert nomads will bow before him. His enemies will fall before him in the dust. The western kings of Tarshish and other distant lands will bring him tribute. The eastern kings of Sheba and Seba will bring him gifts. All kings will bow before him and all nations will serve him. He will rescue the poor when they cry to him. He will help the oppressed who have no one to defend them. He feels pity for the weak and the needy, and he will rescue them. He will redeem them from oppression and violence, for their lives are precious to him. Long live the king. May the gold of Sheba be given to him. May the people always pray for him and bless him all day long. May there be abundant grain throughout the land, flourishing even on the hilltops. May the fruit trees flourish like the trees of Lebanon, and may the people thrive like grass in a field. May the king's name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun shines. May all nations be blessed through him and bring him praise. Praise the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does does such wonderful things. Praise his glorious name forever. Let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. This ends the prayers of David, son of Jesse. 2 Corinthians 9 I really don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem. 
For I know how eager you are to help, and I have been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. But I am sending these brothers to be sure that you really are ready, as I have been telling them, and that your money is all collected. I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. We would be embarrassed, not to mention your own embarrassment, if some Macedonian believers came with me and found that you weren't ready after all I had told them. So I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. But I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your hearts how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all the believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God for this gift. Too wonderful for words. And now may our Lord, who is the gift, too wonderful for words, May he now give his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Good farmers, cheerful farmers. That's what Paul wants to compare us to. He wants to inspire us to live like good, cheerful farmers. Farmers aren't necessarily extravagant, but there is an extravagant heart that is true of many of the farmers I've known. Maybe it's because they know that it's God who provides the seed, and from that seed comes their bread. We, like them, need to see that it is God who is the source of all that we have, right down to the very seed. It all comes from Him. He's the one who gives it, and He's the one who increases it. Remember that the crop that you receive will be in proportion to the seed that has been sown. If you're going to sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. If you sow generously, you will reap generously. These are basic fundamental truths in order for us to become good and cheerful farmers. So let's remember that it's all His right down to the very last seed. Therefore, let us sow generously into the lives of others, those in need, those that need encouragement, those that are out in the field working. And if we do, we will be blessed both to be able to continue in this gift of generosity, but also with the abundance of a full heart that comes from participating with God's generous heart for the whole world. And that, my friend, is exciting. <laughs> it really is better to give than to receive. May God help us to be good and cheerful farmers. That's the prayer that I have for my own soul. That's the prayer that I have for my family, for my wife and my daughters and my son. And that's the prayer that I have for you. May it be so. Well, hey, hey, dear ones. The Lord is risen. He has risen indeed. And I hope that you were able to find a place to worship our risen Lord this Easter Sunday. Heather and I are looking forward to sharing an Easter meal with our daughters, at least two of them, sometime today, and enjoying simple pleasures with 
those that we love. I pray that same blessing for you. May God give you joy today with the blessed hope of the resurrection. Jesus is making all things new. Wonderful. Well, what do you say we all show up again here tomorrow and let's spend some more time together with our resurrected Lord as we break open the bread of life, opening our hearts to the one who is risen. Until that time, let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength. And let us always remember this, that you are loved. No doubt about it. Alrighty, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care.